Okay. If y'all are ready, our presenters, then um, I can get us started. And thanks for introducing yourselves in the chat. Um, I'm excited to see that there's people kind of from all over. Um, so again, thank you for being with us today. Um, we have some wonderful presenters that hail from our Brit Library. They are part of the Sherwin Carlquist team. Um, we received a National Science Foundation grant. Um, we received funding in 2022. And so um, this project is fairly kind of new getting started. And so I think a lot of us are excited to see um, what the process has been like and updates about this project um, from Krishna and Sam. Um, so thank you guys for presenting and you can take it away. Okay, um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes, um, you're good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, Ashley. Thank you to everyone who's here for Armchair Botany and for this presentation, Imaging and Imagining the Sherwin Crawford's Collection. Uh, I'm Krishna Shinoy. I'm the project uh, archivist, and I'm here with my colleague, Samantha Sam Eckberg, and she is the digitization technician. And this is our first time presenting on this project uh, together. And we are very excited to share um, what we've accomplished so far. Um, we've got lots to cover. So I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, start the presentation. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is I'm just gonna give an overview of what to expect today in the presentation. Uh, we're going to take a look at who was Sherwin Crawquest. Uh, we are going to talk about the extended specimen network and the Sherwin Crawquest collection as a whole. Um, and then we're going to get specific and look at the color positive slides that are in the collection and the approaches and strategies that we're taking towards imaging them, um, how we correct them. And I'm using air quotes for that. Um, but we'll be looking at how we uh, correct the images and then also showing examples of before and after we correct them. And along the way, you'll be getting to see a lot of wonderful images from um, uh, Carl Quist's collection of, of slides. And at the end, there will be time for questions. Um, if you want to put questions in the chat, you can do that as well. Um, otherwise, we'll um, you know, answer questions at the end. So the first thing I think we should establish, you know, who was Sherwin Crawlquist? Um, many of you may already know a lot about him, but some of you don't. Um, he was an American botanist and uh, specializing in wood anatomy and uh, island bio biodiversity. He worked primarily uh, associated with the California Botanic Garden. He was their resident plant anatomist there. Um, he was also an educator, though. Um, throughout his career, he taught at Pomona College, Claremont College, and University of California at Santa Barbara. He was an uh, accomplished author, uh, publishing hundreds of articles in the field of botanical studies, uh, but also over 20 books that he had written uh, on, this, on those topics as well. He was a member of the Linnaean Society. Um, he was also a rather talented photographer and artist. He published eight books focusing on the human figure um, and primarily nude photography uh, related to the human figure. Um, he was also an advocate of LGBTQ plus issues and he volunteered extensively uh, for these two foundation, uh, two institutions, the Pacific Pride Foundation and Cottage Hospital in California. Um, and anecdotally, we know that he was a an avid, you know, classical music lover. He apparently had a very large collection of vinyl records um, related uh, to, to classical music. So overall, I mean, I just think this is a person uh, who is really engaged in life with an endless curiosity. Um, both in his professional life and his personal life, and you know, with a, a variety of like personal interests. So that just makes him a very um, 
interesting person to um, to engage with. So uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to kind of look at uh, the life of this uh, grant so far. Uh, but we'll get, take a look at the timeline of the collection and the donation. So in uh, 2018, the collection was donated by Kralquist to Brit. And by the collection, I mean his archival collection, which involved the field notebooks that he had and uh, film materials. And basically that means slides, photographs, and negatives. Uh, in 2021, uh, the former librarian here, uh, Brittany Watts, she, uh, in collaboration with uh, Kralquist Association with California Botanic Garden, submitted a grant proposal to the NSF for their Extended Specimen Network Initiative. And um, in 2022 March, the grant was awarded, but unfortunately, Carl Quist had passed away in December of 2021. So he did not get to see uh, that the grant had been awarded and that this work was about to commence. Krishna, um, yeah. I'm sorry, uh, you need to go to the next slide. There you go. Um, I feel like I'm still on the timeline. Are you not seeing the timeline? Okay, I got it now, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so uh, in June, uh, you know, the, in March, the grant was awarded. In June, the work commenced. And uh, Britt initially started the work by employing a brigade of volunteers to help with curating the um, the, the, the slide boxes the initial containers that the um, that the slides had come to us in. And in November, they hired an imaging team, uh, which includes myself and Sam, and to begin the large scale work of digitizing the slides and the film materials, and uh, also the metadata portion of it as well. Um, I just want to take a minute here just to really underscore this extended specimen network concept um, because it's really critical to the work with, that we're doing. Um, the fact that, you know, Kralquist was very um, robust in his field work and his uh, work that he did with the specimen back in, uh, back, uh, in, the, um, in, the, in the lab. So he collected lots of different uh, associated things, you know, related to the specimen. We have the notebooks, we have photographs, he created index envelopes. Um, there's all the, the actual plant specimen, uh, the wood specimens. So all of this material is now with two different collections. On the right hand, you'll see that for the Fort Worth, uh, that Brit has, you know, the field photographs and the notebooks uh, and the film materials. But the California Botanic Garden is where the herbarium specimens live, the wood specimens, the fluid preserved specimens, and the microscope slides, the thousands of microscope slides. So, um, so we have this collection that is uh, housed in two different locations. And that's really important to what the extended specimen network is. It's trying to link these two collections that are um, physically separated. We want to bring them intellectually together. Um, so this is just an introduction to the, um, the sherwin Colquist Extended Specimen Network team. Um, we have Anna Nino, who you all know. She's the Brit librarian. She is a co-investigator on the project. And our counterpart in California, Mayor Nazaire, she is the curator there and she is a co-investigator as well. Here at Brit, we have Jason Best. Um, he's the director of biodiversity and informatics. And he has been absolutely masterful in identifying efficiencies and automating uh, uh, workflows and making sure that we're doing this project in the most efficient manner as well. Um, and then there's Sam, who brings an incredible amount of digitization and imaging expertise. And then there's myself, who uh, I come from a archival background and library background. So um, I'm hoping to um, 
make positive contributions <laughs> to the project myself. Um, and then finally, on again, uh, along in the along with uh, Mayor, we have Sarah uh, Dave, who is the curatorial assistant at uh, California Botanic Garden, also working on the project. And I think she might be on here. So um, maybe if we have questions, um, she can help also answer them too. But it's an incredible team and uh, we're very excited to co uh, collaborate on this project. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Sam because we're gonna go uh, right into our digitizing strategies and how how we day-to-day -day image the uh, slide collection. All right, thank you, Krishna. So now it is my turn. We're going to be going a little bit more or less surface level into digitizing. Um, you could have a whole hour long presentation on digitizing itself, but we're just gonna try to give a basic overview just so, to add a little bit of interest, show what we're doing. Um, we're gonna go into the slides, hardware and software, how we correct or process and make adjustments to the images to make them more accurate uh, for our intentions. Um, what we do in the camera as opposed to what we do in the software, we're gonna go through a little bit of that. Next slide, please. So here we have the physical organization of our materials, which are going to be little slides, which we will have some examples on the next uh, slide for the presentation. Um, we have these big banker boxes um, with the little slide boxes that were the original containers. They have handwriting from Sharon Carlquist, a bunch of information about what is possibly being contained in those slide boxes. Of course, things get mixed around, but those slides have been moved into archival um, organization here. And we have flat boxes that contain six saltine boxes that are organizing the uh, slides based on little separators from their slide boxes. And so now we digitize based on these flat and saltine boxes, as opposed to the old original slide boxes. And next slide. And here we have some examples of the types of material that we are digitizing primarily at this point. There are thousands upon thousands of these individual items that we will be digitizing. We've gone through a good chunk of them, but we have a long way to go. We just started, but primarily, overwhelmingly, these are color positive slides. They are full color film materials that are translucent um, and they are glued mounted onto little cardboard squares in these two different sizes. Um, we have 127s that are squares and 35 millimeter slides that are rectangular. Um, and there is a whole bunch of different film stocks, a um, bunch of different people that mounted them. The film is from different companies, different time periods, have different variations of degradation. Some have handwritten notes from Carl Quist or otherwise on them. Um, and sometimes they have embossed dates or other information that we may want to preserve when we are digitizing. Next slide. So here's a really quick introduction to the hardware and software that we use in our lab. On the right there, you see we have a camera. We have Sony DSLR cameras, very, very fancy with some, uh, we have a light box below those. They have lenses on them that we put into manual mode. And then we also have movable camera stands to move the camera up and down for different sized film to get the highest quality we can. We use tethering cords to have the camera automatically send the images to the computer as opposed to using a memory card or something else. Um, it sends it directly to our software. And then we also have station tents that block out the light um, from the other stations or just 
general ambient light that may change over time. Um, it kind of gives us a little bit more of a stable uh, imaging area. Um, and on the computers themselves, we use Capture One 23 Pro, which is the software that we edit all of our images in and we export from. Um, and so right now we do all of our editing within that one program. Very, very great. Kind of the amount of things you can do with it is kind of on a Photoshop or Lightroom level. You can do pretty much anything specifically sort of for imaging capture um, is what it is primarily used for. And then we have basic color software, which makes our ICC profiles, which we'll kind of briefly go into later, but it has to do with more accurate color on the images. And then we also use a program called Calibrite, which calibrates our screens to be more accurate across screens and are just more correctly colored. We can go on to the next one. So a really important part of our kind of presentation today and kind of an underlying theme, um, not only introducing the project itself, but to sort of convey what we are attempting to do with imaging, there is a difference between the type of imaging that we are doing, which is to correctly and adequately represent what the actual physical object looks like in its current state as opposed to trying to perfect or correct these images um, because sometimes it's physically just not a good image. Sometimes the image is degraded, which means the film is starting to break down because these are older images. We got some from like the 60s onwards. So some of them are just not good condition anymore. Um, Sherwin Carquest himself may have just taken a couple of blurry images. He used film cameras. Um, he wasn't able to preview his cameras after he took them. Some may be underexposed, overexposed. We are not correcting for any of that. We are only correcting to, in order to adequate, accurately show what is in the image. So we want the final image to look as close to the physical site as possible. And to achieve this, we have to use software to compensate for the hardware differences across different cameras, different software, different computers, whole process. And here we have a few examples on the top left. We have a, kind of a degraded image, kind of pinkish, but it wasn't the original color of the image. Towards the middle, we have a very slightly um, overexposed image. We don't have a ton of those, um, but there are some images that ProQuest himself just took overexposed. A lot of times he corrects for and does a bunch of different um, exposure levels, but some of them just don't look that well. Um, in the bottom left, we have a underexposed image that you can barely see on the screen. Um, and then bottom middle, we have an image where either during processing or something when in front of the lens, just half the image is gone. Um, and then on the right, it's a little difficult to see. I couldn't make the image much bigger, but um, he was clearly trying to get an image of this bee on the plant. Um, and the bee and most of the plant is unfortunately out of focus. And he was not able to get a in-focus image of this bee at the time. We can go on to the next one. Also, the physical mounts themselves, the cardboard outside sometimes has issues in and itself. We have some slides that either they got forged because they weren't mounted well, maybe they went into, they got overheated or maybe some water. We don't really see any water damage, but that is a possibility that could happen in other collections. Um, so, a lot of our slides are kind of bent, so they don't really, really flat. Um, and then also just really even with brand new mounts, sometimes you get these little fibers that are sticking out the side that can get into the image that we don't want. And then also um, who knows where these slides have been and they've been staying in boxes for a long time. Some of them are unusually dusty, which are interesting for us to clean, but we do have to account for that when we are digitizing. Next 
Is that, did a screen change? It did. I think I have a little bit of a delay, but I can read it off of my screen. Okay. Um, so next on... we have the shooting and camera actions. These are the things that we do in the camera or to the slides during shooting to get the best image possible. This gives us the best quality base image for us to process in the program. We try to do the best image the first time in order for us to do the best processing later on to make it more accurate. So some things we do, we focus the camera to make it really sharp and crisp. We frame so that the entire slide is in view. We dust the slide so there's no little teeny tiny dots because of the quality that we do. You will be able to see every single little speck of dust. We change the shutter speed. Um, or the speed the camera takes an image to prevent um, anything from being too light or too dark. And then also we adjust the aperture in the camera in order to get everything in focus. It helps the depth of field and the focus for slides. Okay, and we can go on to the next one. And so here is an example of what the program that we shoot into Capture 123, I think, looks like. Um, and some of the things that we do in the software in order to more accurately portray the image that was taken. Um, we adjust the white balance, we diskew, we crop, we use shadow and highlight levels adjustment, LCC profiles and ICC profiles. We'll go into this a little bit more detailed later, um, just sort of briefly, but that's an overview of a brief list of things that we do to these images in the software after we take the image. All right, do you want, who's the first one? You're the first one, do you want, or no, I'm the first one. No, this one's, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, so we are going to have some befores and afters of the, some images using examples from Carl Quist himself. Um, we will do a before, which will show what it looks like without the adjustments that are detailed on the top of the screen. Um, and then an after showing sort of the difference when we do properly apply these adjustments to the image to sort of show you what happens if we don't do something correctly? What happens if we do do something correctly? And it just gives you a good vision of sort of, oh, the image does look better, more accurate, more usable when we do properly use these adjustments. So we can't go into the first one. Um, this one's one of the more complicated ones to um, describe, um, but for the most part, this has to do with the color. We are trying to accurately represent the color on the physical slide. And so in order to do that, some of the things that we do is we adjust the white balance, um, which is neutralizing the overall image in order to um, have the colors show out a little bit easier um, as opposed to having a pink tint or a green tint too warm, too cold it is a base for us to put the actual image on. And then an ICC profile is a calculated thing that our software does in order to put a color profile that will be applicable across platforms. It will be able to be reproduced um, and this sort of pinpoints colors that no matter what we see on the screen, no matter what the computer says, no matter what our camera is saying, that it knows that this color is supposed to be this color, kind of matches it up. Um, and so we know that this is the most accurate version, even if we look at the image on a screen that is not properly calibrated or something this is going to be a true color image as well as we were able to get to. And so on the left, you see it's a little bit faded, a little dull, a little bit too dark, kind of not really good colors. And then on the right, you see when we accurately do the white balance and the ICC profile, we get really, really rich colors. Um, we get a lot better balance of lights and darks. 
And also the most dramatic is the woman's dress. You really see that color pop out. It seems a lot more saturated um, and everybody looks a little bit more alive. Um, and so that is a lot more accurate to the physical side that we will look at. Um, and so now the color is as accurate as we can get to it. Did you go to the more images of Carlquist slide? Yes. There we go. <laughs> so after each of these exam before and after examples, we are also going to give just a few more random examples uh, from the collection, and um, just to give you all a better overview of sort of the diversity of images that we have. And so here we have a couple of images of Carl Quist himself again, um, one of him with another person in Japan, and then him in Taiwan next to, or on a beautiful building in front of the water. All right, and here we have the skewing and cropping, another sort of bundled um, set of adjustments that we do. Um, De-skewing is basically flattening the image, making it straight because when we digitize, we can't put it in the thing, in our little tray perfectly straight. And then also sometimes images are just mounted even a tiny bit crooked and we have to uh, adjust for that so we can get as much of the image in as possible for it to be as level as Carl Quest intended it for it to be. And then at the same time, we also crop the image. We crop to show the mount, um, but we also crop into the image. So we end up having two images. Um, and here you can see an example of uh, on the left, sort of a not so good cropping uh, and skewing example. We are starting to cut out a little bit extra of the top and the bottom uh, that when you properly skew and crop it, you get that tiny little bit more of information, so we're more drastic than this. And we were trying to get as much information as possible, show the entire image, um, and also make sure it is level as intended. Right. And so here we have more plant images, um, just some really pretty examples, all from Carl Quist himself. This is a pretty good chunk of what the project is. He obviously was primarily a botanist. He was doing field photography. Um, and so we have lots of lovely examples of a very wide variety of plants in different countries, different areas, lots of different colors, varying states of growth. Very lovely examples. I think it's frozen. There we go. <laughs> Yeah, it keeps freezing, freezing for me. I don't know what slide we're on. All right. And then here we have the LCC profile in shutter speed. This is primarily going to do with our lights and darks, how just overall the exposure of the image. Um, LCC profile at the very basic is just making sure that the lighting is even. It corrects for the lighting on just the environment, the lights that we have overhead and then also the um, light box beneath the images. So it just basically make sure there's no extra shadows. Usually there's a tiny bit of shadow on the top and bottom um, and we correct for that. Um, as you can see in sort of the top left gray or the leftmost gray image, we have five little color dots on this gray background. And this is without the LCC profile. Um, and what ends up happening is you have uh, darker outside, so lower number means that the image or the little area that it was picked at is darker. And then in the middle, we have it a little bit brighter. Um, and so all the way on the top right, we have an image with a properly applied LCC and everything is very, very closely even. And so you know the lighting is even across the image. Um, down there at the bottom, we have uh, an example of a image with an improper shutter speed, which means that the camera is going either too fast or too slow. 
when taking an image. And if it goes too slow, it lets in too much light to the image. If it goes too fast, it does not let enough light into the image. And so it gets really dark. And down there we have an example of a shutter speed that is too slow. So too much light is let onto the image and the image is too bright. And so we can't do anything with that image. We are losing information. It just does not look good, it is not accurate to the original image. And so then there on the right, we see an image where you can see all the clouds. It has the proper shutter speed. It has a balance between lights and darks that is closer to the original image as intended. Um, and we aren't losing that sky and all of that. Um, the red that you see on the bottom left there is a setting that we can activate in Capture One to show when we are losing information in the image, either in the brights or the darks. Um, and so that gives us a good indication that there is something incorrect and that we need to adjust to get a better image so that we don't lose this information. And so on the next slide, we have more images by Carl Quest as well of him up in an airplane, up in a helicopter, um, maybe flying, I don't know, but he is doing aerial images um, himself. And so we have some lovely places. We have Vanuatu, New Guinea, and Puerto Rico. Um, some clouds. I think in the second one, you can kind of see maybe the roof of the helicopter or something. I don't know, but there's lots of these aerial images and they are very cool to look at because sometimes he goes to very lovely places. Yeah, he was definitely a uh, window seat kind of guy. No aisle for him. <laughs> All right, I think I have this one. So we have framing and focusing. So framing is basically making sure that the whole image can be seen by the camera. So we get the entire slide mount um, and the image that we are taking. We don't want it pushed up out of the camera. So some is cut off. We have some valuable information on the slide mount that we want to keep. Um, and so then we also focus the camera. We want the uh, image to be as crisp in focus as possible. Um, it just gives us a better image and of course shows better information. Um, and yeah, pretty straightforward. But on this top left here, we see an image that is both out of focus and also we are cutting off the very top of the slide mount. It is out of the frame. Even when you try to crop it, you can't crop it back to get the image in because the original image was taken with some of it cut off. Um, it's also crooked. And so we are not able to, and so we end up having to cut off more of the image. And then the two um, zoomed in images at the bottom show that it is out of focus. The one on the left, we get this kind of blurry, the slide mount information is blurry. You can't really see the grain of the image, it just does not look good. And then on the right, we have a couple of examples of what a properly framed and focused image would be when we crop it down. Um, and so yeah, you can properly see that we got the entire slide mount in. And then also we can see the crispness on the slide mount information there. Um, and so yeah, we get the best image possible. And next we have a lot of lovely images that Carl Quest also did. Um, he not only took a bunch of pictures of plants, landscapes, botanist sort of things, but he also went to a lot of areas with indigenous people, people living their lives, um, and sometimes even cultural events that people were having and took images of them. And some of them are very, very interesting. A lot of them are uh, lots of different varieties. We have uh, some, yeah, we have in the middle, we have a market in Singapore. We have a celebration of Flag Day in American Samoa. And then um, 
some children in the street on Singapore, and then some people on the left. I wasn't able to accurately find where it was, um, but I know it is in Oceania and some people in um, their cultural costume, and it's great. And now I'm going to hand it off to Krishna. Okay. Um, so Sam talked about a lot of the things that we do to correct for light. Um, we can go even further and uh, work with the histograms that are available through Capture One and adjust those a little bit more. And here what we're trying to do is uh, brighten the brights a little bit dark and the darks, bringing the um, the colors a little bit closer to the peaks that we're seeing in the histograms. So the one on the left, you'll see that it has not been adjusted. Uh, and the one on the right, you can see the levels have been increased or brought in towards the peaks. And it's very noticeable in the images below, uh, the one that's adjusted and not adjusted. Uh, you get a little bit more richness of color, a little bit more balance. Um, Sam, am I missing anything? No, for the most part, what we were just trying to do is a lot of the shadow or the darks adjustment is to correct for a fill light that we have. Um, and then also the highlight adjustment just basically brings our uh, lighting up to as far as it can go to get the um, white point of the image as close as possible to what it would have been. Yeah, thank you. Um, so along with you know cultural events and botanical focused images, um, he took a great deal of pictures of uh, architectural features, buildings, temples, um, you know, indigenous uh, uh, dwellings, uh, cityscapes. So there's a great deal of material here for anyone who would be interested in architecture, I think. Um, so lastly, we're gonna talk about uh, the dust and the mount fibers that Sam had initially showed us. And you can see the screen, uh, the image on the left, how much dust a particular image can have. And we do want to remove that without, of course, you know, damaging the slider or anything. So we use um, uh, some gentle brushes to take those materials off. And you can see in the focused images, when you zoom into these images the way a researcher might, there's quite a bit of particulate matter and debris on it. Um, and when we brush all that off and clean it, um, you can see on the images on the right what an improvement that is and how much more um, clarity you get. Back to the one on the left with the dust, you'll see that there's a little fiber sticking out from the mount uh, frame. Those things also will try and we will try and remove. And we were successfully able to do that for this one. If you look all the way on the right at the top, you'll see that that little fiber is gone. And we remove those with uh, with tweezers um, when they're quite large like that one. Um, so removing the dust and the fibers just to ensure that you're getting the best picture um, and representation of the image. So, um, Another uh, category of photographs that we have are the cross sections of plants. And I imagine that, you know, CrawlQuest is doing this in the lab, maybe, maybe even in the field, but these are exactly what you would think. Um, it's a slice through the plant and on a particular plane. And you, it reveals, you know, the interior um, um, features of, of, of any, of any plant specimen. So a lot of them are really uh, fascinating to look at. You see all the plant parts and um, different colors that maybe wouldn't be observable 
you know, unless the cross section was taken. Um, so I hope that's given you some idea of all the steps that are needed that we apply to a single slide. And for this project, we have about 150,000 slides that we are uh, in the, going to be digitizing. Um, it's over 25 distinct collecting regions. And this map um, just kind of gives you an idea of everywhere that Kroc was visited. And you can definitely see that he, his interest was in island uh, biology and biodiversity. He's sort of in that latitudinal range of, um, of, of islands, uh, where islands exist. Um, along with the digitization, you can't do one without doing the metadata. You know, those are hand in hand. So the next part of the project will be uh, uh, putting in the metadata associated with all these uh, objects. And I know that we will be looking for volunteers who would want to maybe help with this project uh, in the metadata aspect of it. Um, we will be putting out um, information about opportunities to volunteer for that. So that's the end of our presentation. I really appreciate you all listening. And we, Sam and I, are really excited to take any questions that you might have. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you guys so much. I have this, just been on like the edge of my seat because I've only just gotten some snippets over the past few years about Carl Quist. So this was really exciting to get to see more of his slides. And I don't think I realized kind of just all the places that he was going and taking images of. And it wasn't just plants. You know, he had so many other interests, which I think is just so wonderful. So I'm I'm really glad that this grant was awarded and that y'all are doing the dang thing. Um, <laughs> there weren't any questions that came in the chat um, during the presentation. I have a few that kind of I was jotting down as y'all were going along. So I guess I'll ask a few of my questions and maybe it'll prompt others who are listening. Um, so y'all had mentioned that, you know, you are trying to portray these as accurately as you can um, whenever you're taking the images and making the corrections. Um, what would you say is like the percentage of those slides that are degraded, blurry, um, et cetera? Are you finding very many of them or are most of them in pretty good shape? Uh, well, degraded, we don't see a ton of those. Some of them, it's a little difficult to tell if it's just because they were an image of an image or something otherwise. Um, but not a lot of his are actually degraded to a degree that's like really obtrusive. Um, as for things like blurry fingers or something in front of the image, out of focus, um, there is a lot of those, I'd say, you know, maybe 30, 40, maybe even up to 50%, depending on what avenue you go down to mm -hmm. sort of determine that. But that's not unusual. It's not really anything against his skills of photographer. He takes absolutely gorgeous images. Um, it's just sort of a byproduct of field photography, film photography itself you're going to have those things happen when you can't look at the image and be like, oh, it was slightly out of focus. Longer exposure times, things are going to get a little bumped, a little bit blurry. Um, you don't have the highest quality lenses or cameras back then. So things just might not be as crisp as something you could get today. And so to a certain extent, there is a lot that aren't the best quality. Um, but we do have a great selection of images that are as good of quality as you could get back then. And so, you know, sometimes just in film, you're going to take one image, you're going to adjust your shutter speed, and you're going to take another image just to make sure that you get the right color, the right focus, the right um, light and dark. Um, so there's a lot of times where he takes 
20 images in a row of the exact same thing and maybe half of them will be like the best image but that's just how it's just how sort it of is. photography in general especially film photography goes so um I am going to switch to the comments or the chat we have a question from Diane um she said, how are you planning to connect the specimens, images, and field notebooks from the two different institutions? I think this is a good question. It is, um, and it is a challenging question. <laughs> so, um, and, and Anna can jump in here as well, but I'll just get started by saying that um, California database Symbiota, so they have the specimens, we have the, the slides, and wherever we have information that tells us what, like whether the collector number or a specific plant name, and we're able to deduce that this particular slide relates to that particular specimen, we will be contributing our um, link to our record. Our, our slides will be digitized and uploaded into the portal to Texas History, which is a local um, which is the database um, for archival digital materials. And so those URLs, that URL will go over into the Symbiota and vice versa, Symbiota will take the URL from our database and put it into their uh, Symbiota database. So we're sort of linking through that methodology. And Anna has shared um, the um, the link to the portal to Texas history in the chat. Yay, thank you. I didn't even know that some had already been uploaded. So that's exciting. Yes, yes. And then we've got Sarah. So oh, yay, from our, the, our California <laughs> counterpart over there asks, are there any slides that you have made the decision to not process and digitize? For example, if an image is underexposed, extremely blurry, blurry et cetera, Mm -hmm. Or for any other reason, at CalBG, we sometimes make the, the decision to not process a specimen if it's in poor condition or missing any data at all. So curious if you guys have run into any slides like that. Right. So um, from an archival perspective, we are not going to curate out the ones that we don't think that are good. We are going to present the collection in its entirety. Um, and... That's really just to be thorough and complete with the collection. And, uh, you know, we leave it to researchers to determine which ones they want to use or which ones they want to access or which ones they think are valuable. Um, that's not a decision that, you know, we are going to make. Um, I guess maybe to follow up a little bit about that. Oh, wait. <gasps> okay. Hi, Sue. Sue has asked, are all of his vouchers digitized in Symbiota? And I imagine that maybe they're still in the process, but I'll let y'all answer. Yeah, I believe they are. And Sarah, maybe you can chime in and say. I, I believe, yes, uh, I believe they are. They have been all digitized. Um, yes, 99%, she said, 99.9%. <laughs> Awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. Um, and let's see. I guess uh, to follow up about um, those about the question about um, if you get rid of anything, um, if it doesn't have data, I had thought, you know, I'm sure that you have slides that have no data at all, but especially like or do you, does every slide, are you finding yeah, has at least I, some data? I have not come across anything that was just blank. Um, That's amazing. Are, yeah, uh, Sam, I don't know if you have seen, come across that, but um, we've done about, you know, 6,500 slides. We've laid our hands on that many so far and everything, you know, it may not be perfect like Sam was saying, but there yeah. are, there is information. I have not come across any blanks. That is, I mean, that is wonderful. And that's definitely different from herbarium specimens that sometimes it, we come across, so. <laughs> right, and and again, you know, I think Sam alluded to this, that, you know, part of the educational thing in this collection is 
the you know observing what a field what what is field photography like sometimes you're you're going to have overexposure or underexposure sometimes uh the view might be partially blocked by something um so i mean all of that is informative uh and we don't want to lose that information yeah absolutely um i'm assuming um, that the adjustments that you have to, to make those L LCC profiles, um, and things like that, is that one image at a time? And there's not really a way to like apply or automate kind of maybe the same settings to like multiple images in a session, but seems like it has to be one by one. So for the most part, everything is um, sort of pre-done and we okay. can save settings, save profiles. The really kind of things that have names, like an LCC profile, ICC profile, um, you know, those sort of things that have those official names. Those are things that we can set, we can create, um, that we can even change um, between different projects, you can input like multiple different ones for different projects. Um, and you just do a little drop down and you can select it, you can make it the default. Um, sort of things with white balance, we check it, but generally you set it and then capture one. You can also have it to where settings transfer over on each consecutive image that you take. Um, and you can change which settings do uh, go over, which ones don't, which ones stop. Um, and we just make sure that they are applying when we do start taking the images day by day. Um, and then things um, like cropping and de-skewing, um, those are things that we do on each image, but we can sort of crop in an image, de-skew an image, and then we can copy that setting with Capture One and apply it to as many images as we want. And you can do that with pretty much any setting in Capture One, you can copy that setting and copy multiple settings at the same time. And then you can apply it to multiple different images. And so there are ways to make it a lot easier on us. And just sort of depending on what the image is like, how different the images are, um, very occasionally we have to do these little adjustments. Um, really the biggest thing that we do individually is that um, on the histogram where we are adjusting the lights and the darks, that really is probably the most um, individualized thing that we do for each one, just because each one has different amounts of colors, amounts of lights and darks, um, even if they're almost the exact same image. Um, and so copying and pasting that setting in itself um, just would not work at all with the variety of images that we have. Um, but for the most part, I'd say like 90% of the things are just things that we check and make sure is correct. And then we can go about our imaging um, for within this project itself. Um, yeah. So yeah. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah. Um, so could you guys tell us maybe your guess? And I'm, I know it probably depends on what kind of slide you're presented with, but like how long does it take from kind of prepping the slide to imaging it and then even I mean I know you're barely starting the metadata stage but like how long do you think it takes for just one slide like digitizing kind of the mm -hmm. whole step I mean digitizing itself um you know we usually do them in sort of groups and batches um you do however many you want to shoot in a session, and then you'll process them all at the same time. But sort of on an individual level, um, it, it's really just a click in the camera. It's transferred into the program. Um, for me, it maybe takes like less than two, three minutes to do all the adjustments that I need to do to make sure it's in focus, to change the lighting and things on it, um, to do the little sliders. Um, and then we also, end up applying the metadata. That's another setting that is just in the program and we set it. Um, we then export it. Exporting is really easy. We have formulas that are set up that we just click, tell it where it's gonna go and it does all the correct 
sizes and everything, uh, naming that we wanted to do, it's sent off um, into our little cloud storage. And then Krishna can take it from here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then um, once it's, once we've exported it, you know, we have to send it to the portal mm -hmm. and that involves, uh, you know, the bagging process to make sure the integrity of what we're sending remains from the, from here to there. So we actually bag them, we put them on external drives and then they're mailed to the portal. Oh. And the portal, yeah. And then the portal will uh, check them and um, they run a bunch of processes on them to make sure that, you know, that they're all good. And uh, then they're ingested into the portal. And then they remain hidden from the public while we kind of come in and apply the metadata to all these slides individually. Um, and then when we're ready, you know, we make them visible to the public and mm -hmm. we can access them, yeah. I would just say, um, I mean, a saltine box is usually about anywhere from 180 to 200 slides. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to get it to the point where you're ready to export, I mean, I think it takes about an hour and a half to two hours, maybe. For me, it does. Sam is definitely quicker than I am. <laughs> a little bit. You're catching up to me. <laughs> but, but yeah, so. No, I think it's, I'm so glad that y'all have been able to find a workflow that you're able to automate or make it make it easier oh, for yeah. yourself along yeah. the way too yeah. no there's lots of little um um cheats that we do in terms mm -hmm. of you know, copying uh and applying things to the batch so yeah, yeah. um a few sorry sam i was just i'm reading from the chat there's a few um comments uh mark phillips was just making sure for those who don't know that are on the call um the portal to texas history is operated by university of north texas and it's just 30 miles north of us um and then sarah asks related to this i was wondering how long it takes to write a title and description for each slide um is there a standard pro is there a process to standardize some of the language or some of the protocol you follow so I mean, yeah. for those who don't know, y'all have been having these transcription parties. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that you've kind of been able to figure out like some way to QC these and like figure out what's the best way to like be transcribing these. So, yes. Yeah. So the transcription relates to the field notebooks. and that Oh, the notebooks, of course, yeah. not the slide that's stuff. A, yeah, that's a monumental yeah. task. We have such an incredible team of volunteers working on that. Uh, we're very close to being done with transcribing and wow. keeping all the notebooks. We think maybe by mid or end of April, we'll be done with that aspect, Amazing. which is very, very, very exciting. Um, uh, but regarding the, the metadata, you know, it's, 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 it's another um, area where we're developing guidelines and best practices. Um, so, you know, take something like a title you know, there is a specific way that you want to present the title. Um, and we are coming up with templates of language and uh, guidelines on, you know, how to describe um, an, a slide title. You think it'd be very simple, but it kind of isn't. Also because in Carl Quest Collection, so many images repeat. You have the same, virtually the same exact view of, uh, of a particular plant there's hardly any change. So it's really hard to come up with a new way to describe something that seems, you know, has three identical um, elements. I mean, three identical um, instances of it. So there's ways to, um, to create a title for those kinds of things. So we're coming up with a, a big um, collection of guidelines. And I just want to jump on with, with what Mark was saying. Um, UNT uh, Portal to Texas History is such an incredible resource that we have. And they have been an amazing team to work with. Um, you know, I think Anna and Jason uh, at the early stages were shopping around and trying to find the best place to hold this collection. And um, hands down, you know, the portal has been really amazing um, place to work with. And I think researchers are really gonna benefit from their 
user interface. It's such so easy to work with, and it's you have all the information right there. So we're really excited that um, that we're partnering with them. They also have a lot of resources for people doing the metadata, a mm -hmm. lot of very easy guides to access that sort of goes step by step of the things that are standard on the portal of how they specifically do things. And then things that are a little bit more open ended like titles and description. Um, we have some guidelines, but a lot of that um, we are making our own standard formats for to sort of guide our metadata people on our project particular so if, uh, if, project. If, if anyone is maybe even remotely thinking of volunteering for the metadata project, there is a lot of support and guidance that we're going to be providing. Um, I think it's an excellent opportunity for anyone who hasn't maybe done that before or who just really wants to get intimate with the Carlquist collection because you're going to be really studying every single slide. <laughs> And I know we're past our one o'clock. If anyone needs to hop off, thank you for joining us. But I do, there's still a few more things in the chat. So we're going to just continue um, mm -hmm. until we get through more of these. Uh, Sue Freire asked, how are you storing the originals? So I know at the very beginning of the presentation, you kind of saw those containers, the banker boxes um, and stuff like that. Are y'all, are they going back in those same containers that you found them? Um, or is that just how they're stored, you know, obviously now, but then afterwards? Yeah, so um, Sam's pulling up the f images. So we, um, we, we are working, when we're digitizing, we're working with each saltine box and, and the, the, each flat box and the saltine box within. And when we finish digitizing, you know, it goes back exactly like that and uh, it goes into our archival storage area here at Brit. So, so that's, that's how, and, and of course these slides will be kept and um, uh, because they are an important artifact of the Sherwin Crawford's collection. Yeah, so they're stored in our library and our mm -hmm. archives in there. And there's a whole section for just all of Carl Quist's stuff. Yeah, yes. Okay. Saltine boxes are acid free. Yep. That is yep. always super important with archives. <laughs> so that's actually good to know. I didn't realize that those were already um, acid free. That is helpful. We have a lot of thanks in the comments, y'all. Um, and I think we got through our last question, unless anyone has any last minute things they'd like to ask or comment on. Um, but again, I just, I want to thank you two for presenting today and I want to thank everyone for hopping on this Thursday and learning a little bit more about Sherman Conquest and all of his, um, exciting archives. Thank you, Armchair Botany. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. All right. Thank you guys. I'm going to end the call for us now. Y'all have a good rest of your Thursday. Thank you. Bye. Bye.